How's it going, folks? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this inning explain, we're looking at James Wan's awaited return to horror in Malignant, where a woman, Madison, is paralyzed by shocking visions of grisly murders, and her torment worsens as she discovers the dreams are, in fact, terrifying realities. She uncovers a mysterious killer with a connection to her past that starts racking up a huge body count. So Wan is primarily known for his horror output and has been behind the birthing of three major horror franchises, The Conjuring, Saw, and Insidious. A pretty impressive feat, to be sure. It was no surprise when the big time started calling, and he went on to direct Fast and the Furious 7 and Aquaman, certainly a far cry from the genre where he cut his teeth. Thusly, there was palpable excitement at him returning to horror and with an original idea to boot. Although after his biggest hits, there is perhaps a preconceived perception of what to expect from the director. When it comes to Malignant, it does seem initially to hew to expectations, spooky, foggy location, slick visual style, and things going bump in the night. But then things start getting increasingly bonkers over the runtime, leading to a third act that was so over the top and unexpected, it became at a point almost deliriously ridiculous. Certainly this was by design to kind of subvert what we have come to expect from Juan, and in that sense, it did work. I definitely didn't see that stuff coming, buddy. The closest that this reminded me to in spirit from his works is 2007's Dead Silence. It's a little cheesy and goofy, but that still works on a basic horror movie level. Puppet Ghost Lady, got it. If Malignant is a throwback to anything, it feels like it is to this time period of horror specifically. But what ultimately makes this one not work for me is that as it barrels towards its insane final act and big twist, more and more plot holes come in that really steamroll everything else. I've seen this in a lot of opinions about the movie. Just shut off your brain and it's a blast. They may be right, but it's probably no surprise to you, I can't do that. It's illegal for you to ask me to do that. Especially now that it's my job to watch this kind of stuff and pay attention to literally every beat on screen. It's what I do. Also, to be clear, sure, there's plenty of dumb shit that I like, but they still work within the rules of their own particular universe. But with Malignant, it feels more like they simply couldn't be bothered. They're there all plugging away on the script like, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't work anymore with this new information. And this makes absolutely Absolutely no sense in the end. Eh, oh well, it's fun, right? It's weird too, because after watching this thing twice, I kept wrapping my brain around its many plot points, and with just an easy little addition or two along the way to connect things, everything would have actually worked script-wise. Easy as that, but it frustratingly doesn't seem like they care. Suffice to say, I wasn't a particular fan of this one. Sure, I did like how nuts it got, but that can't come at the cost to the story for this prickle puss. Regardless of my feelings, I will, as usual, do my best to put the pieces together of the story as intended with every little psychotic bit delved into. So let's check out Malignant, breaking down the story, just what the heck the parkour powerhouse Gabe is all about, and explaining the ending. At an especially spooky seaside hospital back in 1993, Dr. Weaver voices her concerns about a patient called Gabriel. He's getting stronger, and she's worried that they can no longer contain him. The lights go off, and just as she feared, he's gotten loose again. Bizarrely, the guy tells her electric electroshock had no effect. It was like he was drinking the electricity and controlling our machines. Already I'm like, whoa, feeding on electricity? Why was that? Okay. A body is tossed into the hall, and then they get a trank gun at the ready. All the lights explode, everything suddenly cast in red. Weaver takes a shot, hearing high-pitched squealing, and we can't quite make out what the hell that thing is, but it is definitely weird looking. She orders them to strap him in the chair, and they drag the unconscious body, seeing they're wearing panda socks, not exactly the norm for a guy to wear, I mean, wear whatever you want. Our first clue that something is up with Gabriel and just what exactly he is. Weaver chides him for being a bad boy, and Gabriel assumes control over the radio, croaking, I will kill you all. He speaks, the other doctor gasps. He's broadcasting his thoughts. Yep. With no other options, Weaver determines that she can't help, so all they can do is try to cut out the cancer. Cut it out! After a credit sequence that does really feel ripped out of the 2000s, with case files and photos flashing by, accompanied by semi-industrial rock, we flash forward to present day, where things calm down for a bit after that nutty opening. Madison comes home, seeing that she is expecting, and based on her attire, works as a nurse. The pregnancy isn't without its difficulties, venting to her vacant husband Derek 
Eric. The little bundle of joy has been giving her a hard time lately. He callously suggests to, well, maybe stop getting pregnant all the time, asking how many times he has to watch a child die inside of her. Whoa, what a jerk, right? She sheepishly tells him to stop. He can't keep doing this. And his anger bubbles up, demanding to know doing what exactly. He tries to touch her, and she pushes his hand away, which causes him to lose his temper and slams her head into the wall. He is at least immediately apologetic and goes to fetch her some ice. She locks the door and slides down it, seeing her head is really bleeding. You might want to get that checked out, which she especially should know being a nurse and all, you'd think. He tries to reason with her, claiming that it was an accident, but yeah, we know better. Later that night, outside lights start flickering, seeing Madison's breathing growing ragged, her body twitching. Derek is sleeping on the couch and is awoken to rattling in the kitchen. A blender whirs to life, which he shuts off in confusion. The fridge door then mysteriously opens, and he's lured back into the living room by the sound of static. Someone is there, sitting on the couch. He flips the light on, and they're gone. Yet there is still a moving imprint on the couch, as though they are still there, but, you know, just invisible. A figure is suddenly standing behind him, and slams his head violently into the wall. See how you like it, butthead. Madison wakes up later to an alarming amount of blood on the pillow. Are you sure you don't want to go get that checked out, lady? Nah, it's fine, I'm sure. Your head's supposed to bleed all the time. That's what I read in the medical books. She comes downstairs and finds Derek's horrifically broken body, and the black shadow is still there, its bones cracking. Trying for the front door, they tackle it closed, sending her upstairs where she locks the door. They pound on it, nearly knocking it clean off, and she gets knocked back, hitting her head again. Jeez, she needs to be wearing a helmet or something with all this head trauma going on. Cops descend upon the scene, where they inform that the death is actually something quite special, more like something you'd see in a car accident. Not like this. Madison comes to at the hospital. Again, I guess no one checked her bleeding head out ever. Okay. She clearly is confused and doesn't remember anything that happened. Her sister, Sydney, fills her in that someone broke in the house and Derek was killed. Maddie cries that she was so scared and was especially worried about the baby. And when looking down, it appears that she is no longer pregnant. Sydney informs her that unfortunately they could not save the baby, causing Maddie to freak out at the loss. Detective K shows up to ask her some questions, but she's in a kind of comatose state, staring blankly out the window. Sydney joins them, saying she's been like this for two days. He inquires if they had any enemies or people that want to hurt her or whatever, but Sid divulges that she doesn't know. Derek kept them apart. Man, this guy is a real piece of work. The detective randomly brings up that she's had three miscarriages in the past few years, which Sid is shocked to hear. She obviously had no idea. With Derek's body, strangely they've discovered that it appears his attacker was somehow backwards, or even standing on the ceiling, as impossible as that sounds, with word from the neighbor that Derek was abusive, along with no signs of fourth century, Regina theorizes Maddie has the motive to kill him. But wouldn't they have found her fingerprints all over him if that was the case? Uh, probably. Julianna steps out of the shower, and a buzzing street light catches her attention. She stares intently out, and the street is foggy as hell. You can't see anything out there. An obscure dark figure appears, moving slowly towards the house. She goes to lock all the doors and close the curtains, but is foiled by another door wide wide open, swinging in the wind. She hurriedly locks it, hearing objects clattering all around. The door flings itself back open, and in an admittedly pretty slick looking overhead shot, she runs all the way back upstairs to her room. She attempts to convince herself that there's nobody there. It's all in my head. Hmm, could be onto something there, Maddie. The next morning, she steps up her security game, barricading all the windows and adding a ton of extra locks. No ghosties getting in here, bud. Sid tries to come over, and with all the new locks around, has to climb up to the window, where Madison is staring in a daze again at the spot where she hit her head. She shows off the hole from her head, and Sid is disturbed, saying no one deserves to die like him, but screw that guy. She laments that she thought many times of leaving him, but by the time she got the courage to do so, she was pregnant. But wait, if you wanted to leave him, why are you still sleeping with him? At least go on birth control or something, you know? I'm gonna have a mountain of plot holes by the end of this thing. We are just getting started. Ooh, boy. Nitpick. Nitpick, dippity doo. Madison expresses a strange sentiment that is seemingly quite important to her. She's always longed to know what it felt like to have a biological connection with someone, and to Sid's surprise, reveals that she was adopted when she was eight and has literally no memory of anything that happened before then. Mom said her biological mother died during birth, and a super dramatic version of Where Is My Mind kicks in, kind of the movie's theme song, it turns out. They use it a lot. We then meet a seemingly random lady giving her last tour of the night for the old under 
downtown city portion of Seattle. After all the patrons leave, she unplugs the lights and instantly hears something down the darkened corridor. She barks, they can't be down here, and starts walking towards the sound, where she's greeted by a growl and runs back, frantically plugging the lights in, yet there's no sign of anything. The lights blink, and there's an eerie yowling, sounds almost like a cat actually, and the shadow figure jumps down from the rafters, lunging at her. She comes to in a dingy attic, perfect place for an evil hideout, that is for sure. The guy rummages through some belongings and finds some black gloves along with a nice leather jacket. Gotta have a fresh look going, it's important. Gabriel then flaunts his electro powers, taking over the radio, telling her he's been waiting for this a long time. But first, Dr. Weaver, and brings up her cell phone. He straight up calls Weaver himself, calling back to what she told him before, it's time to cut out the cancer. She must recall the voice, digging up a file marked May, 85 to 93, and pulls out a photo staring at it in consideration. Could it be that he's back after all these years? Well, yeah. Madison is busy tidying up the house, but is stopped in her tracks when the lights buzz and the radio unleashes static, causing her to groan in pain. The lights go wacky once more, and she touches the back of her head, seeing it's bleeding again. Unfazed, she stuffs some laundry into the machine, seeing Weaver screaming through the washer's door. The walls at her home start dissolving away, and she's transported to the doctor's abode. Gabriel reminds her that it's time to cut out the cancer. Her yelling back, it's not possible. He snatches up a surgery trophy of hers. She pleads with him, asking, what do you want from me? And he responds to show you what the cancer has become, bashing her good with the trophy. Madison lets out a blood curdling scream and she's back home. Now it's even foggy as hell inside too. How does that happen? The cops make it to Weaver's house where they're greeted by another grisly scene and part of her trophy is oddly missing too. They find her mountain of patients records, including a picture of what is obviously Madison as a child right on top. I mean, the exact same haircut and everything. It's not like anyone changes their haircut over the course of 20 years, right? They vow to go through every single file in search of answers. Back in his murder attic, Gabrielle fashions the trophy into a monstrous gold blade. The other lady starts waking up, yanking at her ropes. To get her to stop, he launches his newly finished knife at her, landing right next to her head. Him grunting, don't even try. With word on the news of Weaver's death, a troubled matter and brings up what she saw to Sid. She also saw the man kill him in her own house like she was there. Gabriel then turns his aggression to another blast from a past, the other main doctor with Weaver from the hospital, Dr. Fields. At his apartment, he discovers the window is wide open despite being closed moments ago. And now Gabriel is there behind him. Without noticing him at all, he plops down in bed, oblivious to his imminent fate. Madison is fast asleep and rolls over just as the lights start buzzing. She gasps, seeing Fields in bed right next to her, him just snoring peacefully. The walls melt away and Gabriel enters, climbing right over her. His movements are notably strange as though he is using his limbs backwards. He proceeds to stab the crap out of the guy and Maddie catches a glimpse of his grotesque fleshy face. Yeah! Maddie wakes up screaming again back in bed and Sid bolts in asking what's wrong. He breathlessly explains that she saw him, he killed again, and is certain that she isn't dreaming. This time, the sisters wisely decide to talk to the cops, yet of course their story sounds a bit absurd at face value, with Sid even pitching that after attacking her, the two have some kind of psychic connection. They're understandably doubtful, but Sid convinces them to just take a look anyway, as Maddie can identify Fields' apartment building. And yeah, there's another mutilated corpse waiting for them, backing up at least in some capacity the girl's crazy story. Though getting a sketch artist done of what Maddie saw doesn't exactly help her case, as Regina sarcastically notes, oh, so we're looking for sloth from the Goonies, huh? Madison leaves in a huff to the bathroom and starts grunting in pain knowing Gabriel is making his presence known. He gives her a ring and forces her back to those forgotten childhood memories, calling her Emily. She asks who he is and he tells her, you already know. Even if you say it's only in your head, you let them tell you it wasn't real. You believe them, now he's going to make them pay for what they did. One by one, he demonically cackles. I mean, it was already pretty obvious he was going after the doctors from the hospital, but okay. Thanks for spilling the details on your big plan there, Gabe. She even calls him by his name, pleading with him to stop. But he scoffs, we're just getting started. But how did she know his name, hmm? Earlier, Kay gave a technician a photo of the girl from the file and now has the results of her aging up. And there is no question that it is Madison. Him finally realizing she was a patient at the hospital. Oh, an excellent job on that Photoshop, my guy. Clearly professional work. Maddie relays to Sid about her encounter with Gabe in the bathroom, even admitting she didn't know how she knew his name. It must be something from before she can remember. So they visit their mom's house and get right into the questions. She doesn't remember her having any siblings, so Maddie wants to know, along with the rest of us, 
Who the hell is Gabriel? At the name drop, a wave of concern immediately washes over her mom's face. She then shows him a tape from way back in 93, just after Maddie was adopted, at her ninth birthday party, so one year after she left the hospital. Her parents cheer on as she blows out the candle, and little Mads turns to an empty chair, clearly addressing Gabriel, even telling her folks as much. They think that he must be an imaginary friend, but she is adamant he's real. Already he's been telling her that they're not really her family, and Pops is frustrated with this shit. Things only get more severe over time, jumping forward to another VHS from Christmas Eve 1994, when Jean is pregnant with Sydney. Maddie is on the phone with Gabriel, arguing with him about whether they will still love her after the baby comes, but Maddie says mommy promised to still love her just as much. After he says something else, she cries, please don't hurt the baby. Her dad enters worriedly asking what's going on, and she quickly hangs up, assuring him nothing is going on, daddy. Just talking to my ghost friend on the phone. Mom recounts their feelings back then regarding her so-called friend. There were many conversations just like this that chilled them to the bone. She knows that whatever trauma she went through as a child has hurt her deeply, and perhaps this is why she created Gabriel, to survive that. Her hope was that if she gave her enough love, she would no longer need him anymore. More. Meanwhile, Kay is still digging through the records and finds a trove of USB sticks buried in one of the books. He pops it in and there's a file of Weaver discussing the patient Emily May. She's been there for seven years and says that she is unlike any other patient they've had, showing signs of psychosis as well as hearing the voice of the devil, she says. There's a photo there of her caretakers and amongst the three pictured at this point, only one is still alive. Kay searches for his address and luckily he still lives in the area 30 years later just like everybody else in the movie. Good thing Gabriel doesn't have to drive too far, isn't that convenient? So we know what comes next, as Gabriel has found his next target in John. In the bathroom, Madison sees John's reflection in the mirror, and she's transported to his place, where he's chilling in the tub. Gabriel steps out from behind her, and the cops show up, busting into the bathroom, but by then he's already done for. Madison stands by, shouting in an echoey voice to them, he's still here. But no one can hear her, of course. Gabe jumps down from the ceiling, the two struggling on the ground. They shoot a few rounds, and they completely completely miss every time, now more than ever seeing that he's moving in a very strange backwards fashion, which doesn't seem to slow him down much though, parkouring all the way down the fire escape on the side of the building. Impressive and incredibly weird. Kay feebly pursues him, following him through a window that leads back down into old Seattle. In a rubble filled room, Gabe makes quick work of the terrain, flipping and dancing with ease through all the various obstacles. Kay shoots some more and completely misses again. Man, do they have target practice at Seattle PD or what dude? In another forgotten holding area, Gabe hurls a stagecoach at Kay. He keeps searching the foggy area, seeing that he's waiting for him on the roof. He jumps down, slicing at him and grabs him, tossing him away like nothing. So yeah, Gabriel, pretty strong. He's quite acrobatic too, escaping easily through a small hole in the ceiling. So he lost him after all that. Way to go, Kay. The detectives inform Maddie of what they've uncovered about her identity that she and Emily May are one and the same, and that the victims were her doctors, so to unlock her repressed memories, they bring in a hypnotist. She sends her back to her days at the hospital. She doesn't remember why she's there, but feels that she knows she's better now. She has her new parents and a nice new home, but he still followed her there. A cake congratulating Jean for the upcoming birth has been messed up, but of course Maddie blames Gabriel when her parents confront her, as was for the case that anything bad that happened. She then gets upset by his constant interference. When he calls on the phone, she shrieks for him to go away. He continues to speak anyway, and she reacts with, but she's sleeping. Then she asks, oh, like a good surprise? The gravelly voice encouraging her to get a nice slice of cake for her mommy. The environment sloughs away, just like with Madison, getting transported around, and she finds herself standing before her sleeping mom with a knife in her hand. The voice urges her to cut her, but the girl screams, no, it was Gabriel. Present Maddie can't handle bringing up all these old wounds and completely loses her shit, forcing Beverly to break her hypnosis. Madison wheezes that she remembers everything now, just like now, similar things happened to her when she was a child. And she now knows that Gabriel obviously wanted to hurt the baby, kind of jealous for Maddie assimilating with her new family even further, which also means that she doesn't need him anymore. So he was right, as over time he became a lost memory. That is until the bonk on the head, courtesy of Derek, which woke him up. 
Appreciate it, Derek, you jackass. The lady in the attic manages to get herself free of her restraints and randomly trips, falling right through the ceiling. And it turns out is at Maddie's house, tumbling through the floor to everyone's surprise. Q, where is my mind again? So Gabe's killer workshop was literally right above their heads. And that definitely does not look good for Madison, who is promptly arrested thanks to the mountain of evidence that she's responsible. It's only more damning when the attic is searched and they find his costume and blade hung up there on display. They slam her with the case against her, yet Madison maintains that it's Gabriel responsible. She grows agitated at the repeated accusations and yells, it's the fucking truth, causing all the lights in the room to explode. This time it's Kay who gets to have a word with Gabriel, him asking who he's talking to. He tells him he knows, he's already met him. As in their pathetic chase sequence, all Gabe wants is his stuff back. When Regina asks why he's incriminating Madison, he calls her a dumb bitch for not knowing he was clearly the one responsible. Sid, meanwhile, makes her way to the hospital, learning from some lady on the phone that it's been sitting there abandoned since the 90s. She rounds a corner, seeing the stately building, and can't help but stare mouth agape at the ominous structure. Uh, she parks right by the cliffside, good choice, and is easily able to slip in since there's no lock or nothing, she makes her way to the records room and she finds Emily May's dusty file. Notes read something about the result of absorption in utero growing in sync with the patient. It's also a couple of VHS tapes, which she checks out with Jean, even though there's absolutely no way any of those tapes would work after all that time and being stored in those conditions. Reminds me when I was a kid and I bought a copy of Swingers on VHS and after watching that thing twice, it already had tracking all over it. Point being, VHS is not the most robust format. Oh well, exposition dump time, woohoo! In July of 1985, they speak with Madison's birth mother, Serena, learning that she was raped when 15, and according to her mom, the pregnancy is a transgression against God, an abomination. With nowhere else to turn, the doctors assure her they'll give the child the best care they can. They connect the dots that Serena was the lady in the attic, so there you go, that's why he wanted her. They pop in the next tape from 92 with Emily slash Madison, where they have sedated Gabriel so they could speak in private. She says she's not okay and is scared, and the doctor is also concerned that she's growing more aggressive. The girl blames Gabriel, telling her to do things like hurt people. It sounds like she has already hurt someone called Bobby, despite him being twice her size. Emily explains that he makes her strong and told her to kill Bobby. Sometimes he speaks words, and other times only words in her head. He pretends to be nice, but really, he's the devil. They like saying the same thing over and over, I guess, in this movie. Weaver decides to wake him up, and we finally see what the thing looks like. Like, on the girl's back, there is a horrific little guy sticking out and screaming with his tiny arms waving around. What the fuck? Okay, so now we know that we're not actually dealing with a supernatural situation here. Keep that in mind for later. Weaver lays it out that Gabe is an extreme version of a teratoma, which is a tumor consisting of hair, bones, and muscle, in this case, like parasitic twins. When there are two embryos that form in the womb and they don't separate correctly, one becomes the dominant twin. The lesser one can't survive without the other. Like a parasite, he's been feeding off of Emily. There's a one more tape to go from right before the opening sequence. The doc is starting to think Gabriel can actually take over her brain, showing her what he wants her to see. He is able to essentially trick her mind, placing her in a mental prison, allowing Gabe to hijack her body and use it himself. She utters her catchphrase, time to cut out the cancer, as he is feeding on her more than ever. The only way to save her is to excise the so-called tumor, malignant, gotcha, there you go. However, they can't remove the entirety of it as they are conjoined at the brain. So they cut out as much as possible and just literally push that stuff back up in her head. Yeah, just get back in there, squishy. Well, now the cat's out of the bag. Gabriel is actually a part of Madison, which we see in action where she's kept in a cell with a bunch of other rough looking customers. They rip on her a bit for being a princess and stuff and then turn randomly violent for no reason, starting to kick the shit out of her. She starts tearing at the back of her head and rips open the flesh, revealing Gabriel's little snarling face there. Hi, buddy. Maddie stops screaming and gets to her feet. Gabe now in the driver's seat. Oh, that was a fun rhyme. He cracks her bones backwards and goes on a bloody rampage. The one lady that started it all keeps throwing more girls at her, which was actually pretty hilarious. They all get absolutely destroyed. Skulls crushed and throats ripped out, all done with his signature weird backwards movements. Just really weird looking. A cop finally shows up after everyone has been slaughtered and he easily knocks him out to get free. Sid informs Kay of all the recent batshit revelations. She thinks they have to talk to Serena. She's the only one that knows anything. After getting back his outfit, the detectives 
entered, seeing that Gabriel has already been a busy boy. He then enters the main bullpen and absolutely slaughters like the entire precinct. Things suddenly turning into a psychotic action sequence straight out of John Wick or The Matrix or some shit. Definitely Keanu Reeves movie. It's total bedlam as more and more cops are slain. Kay sees her and calls Maddie's name. She is seen in her literal mental prison, but reality starts to seep in. Her surrounded by cops' corpses in the cell. But Gabe maintains control. Kay and Regina do their best to hold him off, but they don't stand much of a chance. Regina gets a shotgun, but as usual, she misses every single shot. Seriously need to work on their aim around here. They attempt to flee, and Gabe straight up launches a chair across the entire bullpen and beams him, allowing him to saunter right out the front door. Well, so much for the entire Seattle PD, apparently. And that sequence is definitely a tipping point in the movie from being one thing to something else entirely. I genuinely laughed my ass off watching this part unfold before my eyes just absolutely insane. Sid gets shot down by a guard at the hospital, but Gabe isn't too far behind and attacks the man's pacemaker until it explodes out of his chest. The lights go dark and he's there, growling over the intercom, I saved you for last. He expresses frustration that Maddie chose her over him and he should have killed her before she was even born. With the most convenient timing ever, Serena comes out of her coma and asks Gabe for his forgiveness. She feels guilty for giving him away and should have loved him no matter what. I kind of can see why you would not want to be dealing with that. Gabe considers her words, and they are interrupted by Kay, wildly firing as usual. And hey, he finally gets her a few times for once. Nice shooting, bud. Gabe flings the knife, getting him right in the shoulder, and Sid goes for his gun. Gabe goes her to kill him, and she tries to reach through to Maddie, but he retorts, she's not home. She knows he was actually the cause of all of her miscarriages, feeding off of fetuses to gain his strength. You know, I wonder how many fetuses he needs exactly. Is it like one fetus, and you're for six months? Does it take a certain number or need some more data on that? You know, how it works baby versus power? Yeah, that's all I'm asking. Gabe throws a massive piece of equipment that traps Sydney. Seeing her sister in mortal danger, Madison is pushed into action. She clenches her fists and begins to take control of her body. Gabe puts a gun to Sid's head, telling her goodbye, and fires. Oh no! He then approaches his mother and jams his hand over her mouth, suffocating her. However, we see that this didn't happen as Gabe thought, and Maddie has actually taken control. The walls melt away as she turns the mind tables on him. She steps out from the shadows, boasting that she can now do all the mind tricks he can, and see that he didn't actually fire. You got tricked, Gabe. He can't believe it, calling it impossible. She reminds him that they do share the same brain, dum-dum. Maddie asserts that she's taken her mind and body back, my everything. Now you get to live in the world I create. He shouts after her like a Scooby-Doo villain, I'll get you sooner or later. She knows that he'll be back, but this time she'll be ready. I'll be waiting for you. Her head reforms itself and she shifts her limbs back forward into their natural position. She apologizes to Sydney and vows to lift the equipment off of her. She's dubious that she's strong enough, but Maddie knows that if he could do it, then she can too. Mama's still alive too, so that's good. Harkening back to earlier, she tells Sid all she wanted is to have a blood connection with someone, but didn't realize it was right in front of her all along. Blood or not, you will always be my sister, she gushes. I will always love you. The power of sisterly love. Okay, great. We focus in on a light in the room, really lingering on it there, and it finally starts buzzing. Uh-oh, looks like Gabriel isn't gone after all. Oh boy, well there you go. Before I even unpack the whole can of cuckoo worms before me, let's start with the ending. When it concluded with her just hugging her sister, her mom's all smiles, I was like, uh, no. You can't just end it here. Maddie or Gabriel or whatever just literally killed like 40 dudes, police officers at that. So what the heck can even happen next? She's gonna go to jail for the rest of her life, you know? That's really the only outcome possible here. So what if she bonded with Sid? Who gives a crap about that? Already I'm going, why? Why did you do it this way? I don't understand. The big twist of it specifically not being supernatural, it's a tumor that's part of her, also makes things completely unravel in a bunch of other ways. I'm just like, it's so much cleaner to make him just a ghost demon dude, or maybe that part of him they cut off, survived somehow, and he's been eating babies all these years or whatever. Now he's back for revenge. I don't know. At least that makes sense to the story as established. Sam goes for the electrical powers. He's feeding off the electricity, remember? Without it being supernatural, how the hell does that make any sense. 
It doesn't, that's my point. Even going back to the beginning, Gabriel appears to Derek and then turns invisible, making fridge doors open and shit. How does that work? Maddie can't literally turn invisible. Also, why was it a powerful ninja parkour badass too? She does at least say that he makes her powerful, but why? Again, if it's a ghoul or something, that works. Not that a tiny lady can suddenly be flying around, killing people, jumping in the holes in the ceilings. No matter. As I mentioned at the top of this thing, all they had to do was add one little extra niblet of story and everything would have been hunky-dory. All right, hear me out. You could have done the exact same outcome, but mentioned that the birth dad make him a Satanist, did a ritual or something. There you go, covers everything. It's that simple. It's not perfect, but it makes all the stuff you've done come together coherently. For me, I would have had it where he's actually trying to find a way to separate himself from her, and that's where we end up in the end. Gabriel becomes his own separate physical entity. Since they kind of set up a sequel, we could have Maddie trying to take out her new free brother, and we already know that he is quite a formidable foe, pretty much like a crazed supervillain running loose. This outcome would also help cover the ending too, because at this point, Madison is definitely going behind bars. No one is going to be able to convince anybody that she wasn't technically responsible. It's her, her body, case closed. There's literally no way around that. Hopefully they at least put her in like a Magneto super cube or something next time, because she's just going to get out again and kill everyone. That ain't going to work, boys. Get the cube! <laughs> yes, I'm well aware that I'm on quite a tirade at this point, but like I said, it is my job to pay attention to this stuff, and this one was just straight up sloppy in so many ways. Sorry, if you like it, we can still be friends. It's okay. And with that, seems like a good place to wrap things up. We've reached the conclusion of this ending explained from Malignant. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Malignant and its ending? What's your favorite James Wan movie? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.